Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Tuesday, April 5th, 2022. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky sharply criticizing the United Nations Security Council for not holding accountable those behind Russian soldiers raping, torturing, and killing civilians in Ukraine. Zelensky is saying those responsible should immediately be brought up on war crime charges before a tribunal like the one set up in Nuremberg, Germany after World War II. The U.S. Senate votes not to take up a $10 billion COVID-19 pandemic preparedness bill. The total, $10 billion, is a deal negotiated by both parties in the Senate, but not agreed to yet is what amendments should be allowed. Republicans want one on the Title 42 immigration issue. There's also some question about how a $10 billion bill, smaller than many Democrats had wanted, will fare in the U.S. House. Former U.S. President Barack Obama returning to the White House for the first time since he left office in 2017, joining President Joe Biden to promote Obama's signature domestic policy achievement, the Affordable Health Care Act, also known as Obamacare. And the Senate continues work on Supreme Court nominee Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson. And with three Republican senators saying they will vote yes, it appears all but certain that she'll be confirmed by the end of the week. New York Times writes, raging at Russia over growing evidence of atrocities, President Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine on Tuesday delivered one of his most forceful denunciations of the invasion in a live video speech to the United Nations Security Council, calling the Russians war criminals who he said had killed families, raped women in front of their children, pillaged homes and left his country in ruins, as he said, filled with mass graves. The Times article goes on in his speech a day after touring Buka, a suburb of Kiev, the capital, where images have surfaced of many bodies of civilians. Mr. Zelensky said were killed by retreating Russian troops. The Ukrainian president said the Security Council was useless if it could not find a way to hold the perpetrators to account. Here's part of his speech. The Russian military and those who gave them orders must be brought to justice immediately for war crimes in Ukraine. Anyone who has given criminal orders and carried out them by killing our people will be brought before the tribunal, which should be similar to the Nuremberg tribunals. I would like to remind Russian diplomats that a a man uh, uh, like uh, von Ribbentrop has not escaped punishment after for crimes in World War II. I would lo- also like to remind you that Adolf Arkman also did not uh, gone, uh, did not go unpunished. Nobody uh, of, uh, of them escaped the punishment. But the main thing is today is to, to, it's time to transform the system, uh, the United Nations. So therefore, I propose to convene a global conference, and we can do it here in peaceful cave in order to de- determine how we are going to reform the world security system, how we will rely, uh, uh, how do we establish guarantee of uh, recognition of borders and integrity of states and countries, how we will assert the rule of international law. It is now clear that the goals set in San Francisco in 1945 for the creation of a global security international organization have not been achieved, and it is impossible to achieve them without reforms. Therefore, we must do everything in our power to pass on to the next generation an effective UN with the ability to respond preventively to security challenges and thus guarantee peace, prevent aggression, and force aggressors to peace, have the determination and ability to punish if the principles of peace are violated. Uh, There can be no more exceptions or privileges. Everybody must be equal. All participants of international relations, regardless of economic strength, geographical area, and individual ambitions. The Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, part of his speech through an interpreter given remotely to the United Nations Security Council in New York City. U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Linda Thomas-Greenfield also speaking at the Security Council meeting, talking about the killings in Buka, that suburb of Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. And she called on the U.N. General Assembly to vote to suspend Russia from the United Nations Human Rights Council. We've all seen the gruesome photos. Lifeless bodies lying in the streets, apparently summarily executed. Their hands tied behind their backs. 
As we work to independently confirm the events depicted in these images, I would remind this council that based on the currently available information, the United States has assessed that members of Russia's forces have committed war crimes in Ukraine. And even before seeing the images from Bucha, President Zelensky, along with others in the region, were reporting that children were being abducted. And we heard him say that today. Also abducted are mayors and doctors, religious leaders, journalists, and all who dare defy Russia's aggression. Some of them, according to credible reports, including by the Maripol City Council, have been taken to so-called filtration camps, where Russian forces are reportedly making tens of thousands of Ukrainian citizens relocate to Russia. Reports indicate that Russian federal security agents are confiscating passports and IDs, taking away cell phones, and separating families from one another. I do not need to spell out what these so-called filtration camps are reminiscent of. It's chilling, and we cannot look away. Every day, we see more and more how little Russia respects human rights. And that is why I announced yesterday that the United States, in coordination with Ukraine and many other UN member states, will seek Russia's suspension from the UN Human Rights Council. Given the growing mountain of evidence, Russia should not have a position of authority in a body whose purpose, whose very purpose is to promote respect for human rights. Not only is this the height of hypocrisy, it is dangerous. Russia is using its membership on the Human Rights Council as a platform for propaganda to suggest Russia has a legitimate concern for human rights. U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Linda Thomas-Greenfield at the U.N. Security Council meeting in New York City. The United Nations Human Rights Council is 47 members elected for staggered three-year terms on a regional group basis headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland. Removing Russia from the council takes a two-thirds vote of the U.N. General Assembly, which is all the nations, over 190 currently. Ukraine is also currently on the U.N. Human Rights Council. The Russian Federation Ambassador to the U.N., Vasily Nebedsia, also speaking at U.N. Security Council meeting. The Russian Federation is one of the five permanent members of the Security Council and has a veto and has used it so far to reject statements, a resolution that condemns Russia's invasion of Ukraine. That's one of the reforms that the Ukrainian President uh, Zelensky wants is to get rid of that veto. Russia Federation today again calling the invasion a special military operation whose goal is to reach a true lasting peace by ridding the Ukrainian government of Nazi influences. Nebetsia also saying that it was Ukraine's harsh treatment of Russian-speaking Ukrainians in eastern Ukraine that forced Russia's hand and that the hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians who have reportedly been sent to Russia were not forced but voluntarily evacuated. He also said the dead bodies in the streets of Bucha, all fake. We're seeing blatant criminally staged events with the uh, Ukrainian civilians who were killed by their own radicals uh, in the best traditions of Goebbels to accuse the Russian army. Those killed in the areas from which the Russian forces withdrew after encouraging peace negotiations in Istanbul. So now it turns out that we shouldn't have withdrawn. I'm talking about Bucha, first and foremost. I understand that you... Uh, were shown, you saw corpses and heard testimonials, but you only saw what they showed you. You couldn't ignore the flagrant inconsistencies in the version of events which are being promoted by Ukrainian and Western media. The fact that the corpses were not there right after the withdrawal of the uh, Russian forces, which is confirmed by several videos, and the fact that there are recordings where Ukrainian radicals urged shooting at those with white armbands, in other words, against civilians. If you saw the, the video very uh, carefully that was shown today, you'll see that those people who are on the ground have white uh, armbands. These are civilians. 
And the fact that the corpses on the video in no way resemble those that could have been lying on the street for three or four days. And based on the sensational and completely scientifically absurd information of the New York Times, they were there since the 20th of March. So the only ones who could fall for this fake are absolute dilettantes or our Western partners who don't want to hear anything and have, have been calling black, white, and vice versa for a long time now. Unfortunately, these countries don't give a hoot about Ukraine itself. It's simply a pawn in the, in the geopolitical game against Russia, which they will sacrifice easily. But in the meantime, they will try to prolong the conflict uh, by delivering as much weapons as possible and ammunition. Vasily Nebedzia is the Russian Federation ambassador to the United Nations, part of his speech through an interpreter at today's U.N. Security Council meeting at the U.N. in New York City. The Biden administration plans to announce additional sanctions targeting Russia on Wednesday, the White House confirming that, and the and NBC News reporting that under the new measures, according to their sources, the U.S., will ban all new investment in Russia, increase sanctions on financial institutions and state-owned enterprises in Russia, and sanctions on its government officials and their family members. And the package is being organized in coordination with the G7 and the European Union. Also from CNBC, the prospect of a Russian debt default once again been brought to the fore, with U.S. Treasury blocking dollar-denominated debt payments from Moscow via U.S. banks. CNBC says the move on Monday evening prevents the Kremlin from paying holders of its sovereign debt with the more than $600 million of dollar reserves held with U.S. financial institutions and is aimed at forcing Russia to either use up more of its own stockpile of dollar reserves or accept a first debt default in decades. In Washington, D.C., Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and General Mark Milley, chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, testifying before the U.S. House Armed Services Committee. The committee chair, Adam Smith, Democrat from Washington State, asking them about what can be learned from Russia's war in Ukraine, now going on six weeks. What lessons have we learned as we've watched the last month plus now of the fight in Ukraine? Because you've got Russia, a global power, uh, going up against a much, much smaller, less armed, uh, less resourced foe and struggling mightily um, in, in doing that. As we look at what we need to build and how we need to think about deterrence, you know, we, we all we want to be ready for the fight if it comes, but the main goal of what we're trying to do here is to build a force that will deter adversaries. Um, Iran, China, Russia, you know, being at the top of that list, North Korea. What have we learned about what we would need? As you see, I mean, obviously one of the lessons is the tank isn't what it used to be. How is that informing for both of you what you think is most important to fund to make sure that we have that deterrence for, for, for the battlefield that we face today with the technology that is available? Well, we've learned that armed with the, with the right capabilities, uh, a determined um, force uh, can do uh, tremendous work in terms of defending itself, and the Ukrainians uh, demonstrate that each and every day. We, we've seen them, uh, again, blunt the, uh, uh, the advance of a far superior force uh, with respect to the, the Russians in terms of numbers and capability uh, by using the right types of techniques and, and the right uh, uh, weapon systems. The Javelin, uh, the Stingers uh, have proven to be very, very uh, effective in this fight. Um, we've also learned that, uh, that just because you have the capability, it doesn't mean that you're going to overwhelm uh, a, another force uh, easily. The Russians had uh, have significant uh, mechanized capability, but as you look at the techniques and tactics, procedures that they used, uh, they were not very effective. And so you question the training, uh, the leadership at the, at the, at the uh, non-commission level, non-commission officer level, uh, and, and their ability to provide basic logistics uh, to a force that size. Those are the things that have given them significant problems over the, uh, over the last several weeks, in addition to their inability uh, to link uh, you know, air power to, uh, to the ground effort. Uh, but there are a number of lessons that have been learned. Uh, I think um, because the Russians have not been effective in using their, their armor, uh, it does not mean that armor is ineffective on the battlefield going forward, it means that they were ineffective because of the things that they failed to do uh, in this fight. Thank you. Chairman Milley? 
Uh, just a couple of comments briefly. One is the importance of intelligence. Uh, we've had extraordinary intelligence all, all throughout, and the intelligence sharing that we've uh, enabled uh, Ukraine to see. So I, I, I wouldn't uh, suggest that it's at the level of the ultra-secret sort of thing from World War II, uh, but the ability of us to transmit information that is useful uh, to Ukraine has been enormously helpful, I believe, to them. And, and I talk to my Ukrainian counterpart uh, several times a week, so he has reiterated that multiple times. Secondly is the importance of leadership. That's at the national level. I think that's been pretty clear with Zelensky, but also at the tactical level. Uh, Ukraine has been trained by the United States uh, since 2014, uh, and they have given me feedback personally saying that that training has been quite effective in terms of the concept of mission command, distributed uh, junior level leadership, a development of an NCO corps, junior officers that have initiative. Uh, that is not present in the Russian army that is present right now in the Ukrainian army. And you see the effects of mission command, decentralized operation, uh, and, and that is working out extraordinarily well on the battlefield. The third piece, I would say, is focusing on that which gives you the best effect uh, on a battlefield, uh, which in this case has been anti-tank weapons and air defense weapons that deny the Russians uh, the ability to maintain air supremacy or even achieve air superiority. And the last thing, you mentioned character of war. One of the things we know is that by mid-century, roughly speaking, 90 percent of uh, the uh, eight or nine billion people that are going to inhabit the Earth, uh, they're going to be living in highly dense urban areas. Uh, so the, the character of war is going to shift, character of war being how you fight, with what weapons you fight, the organization, the tactics, et cetera. That is going to shift. We've seen precursors of that in the battles of Mosul and Raqqa. We're seeing, again, uh, Kyiv, uh, Kharkiv, and all these urban battles. So what you're seeing is forces that are optimized to fight in rural, wooded, rolling hill type terrain uh, are going to have very, very difficult times in urban terrain. Uh, and that proved true, and that's one of the reasons why the Russians are withdrawing from Kyiv, because they couldn't mass the combat power to seize Kyiv. Uh, so urban battle is going to dominate land combat in the future, and that will then also drive uh, our uh, use of helicopters, our use of radios, our use of tanks, armored vehicles, light infantry, dismounted light infantry, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of lessons to be learned, and I've got a whole laundry list that we've been working with the Ukrainians on, uh, but that's just the, the tip of the iceberg. General Mark Milley chairs the Joint Chiefs of Staff, along with Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, testifying before the House Armed Services Committee. A lot of questions to them about Russia's war in Ukraine. Also, the hearing talking about President Joe Biden's defense budget proposal for the next fiscal year, FY 2023, which starts in October. We covered it in its entirety. You can find the video at cspan.org. Another exchange from the hearing, this is how CNN reports it. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and Congressman Matt Gates, Republican of Florida, got into a heated argument during Tuesday's House Armed Services hearing after the Florida Republican accused the Pentagon of being too focused on wokeism and not defense. CNN goes on. Gates began his remarks by pointing to a lecture from National Defense University on socialism before arguing that the U.S. military had fallen behind China on hypersonic weapons. Here's part of that. You guys told us that Russia couldn't lose. You told us that the Taliban couldn't immediately win. And so I guess I'm wondering, what in the $773 billion that you're requesting today is going to help you make assessments that are accurate in the face of so many blown calls? You, you've, you've seen what's in our budget. You've seen how the budget matches the strategy. And so I'll let that speak for itself. Well, I mean, I've also seen that we're behind, Mr. Secretary. We're behind in hypersonics. We failed to deter Russia. Last year, China so what do you, what do you, more what do you mean we're behind in hypersonics? How, how do you... How okay, do you, who do you, who's ahead in hypersonics? How, how do you... How do you, how do you how do you make that assessment? I don't know. How, is, is I make that assessment one, because is China is yielding hypersonic weapon hypersonic? systems and we are still developing them. Are I make that assessment because Russia actually used or development one. Of By the way, your own people brief us that we are behind and that China is winning. Are, are you aware of the briefings we get on hypersonics? I am certainly aware of briefings that we provide to, to Congress. But it, it's not just the hypersonic. It's all over the world. It's in Taiwan, where China last year flew more sorties than ever before. It's North Korea on pace to shatter prior records, the number of missiles that they, that they are testing. And so while everyone else in the world seems to be developing capabilities and being more strategic, we got time to embrace critical race theory at West Point, to embrace socialism at the National Defense University, to do mandatory pronoun training. Do you it's, assess? You know, it's, it's, again, this is the most capable, the most combat-credible force in the world. It has been, and it will be so uh, going forward. 
Not if we continue down this path. To do that. Not if we embrace socialism. The, the fact that you're embarrassed by your by your country. By oh no no, no I'm embarrassed by I'm, your leadership. I'm sorry for I am that. not embarrassed for my country. I wish it's we were not losing saying. to China. It's I what wish you're we saying. Were, you know what? The that's you know that is so. That is so disgraceful that you would sit here and conflate your failures with the failures of the uniformed service members. You guys said that that Russia would overrun Ukraine in 36 days. You said that the Taliban would be kept at bay for months. You totally blew those calls. And maybe we would be better at them if the National Defense University actually worked a little more on strategy and a little less on wokeism. Has it occurred to you that Russia has not overrun Ukraine because of what we've done? And our allies have done. But that was have, baked have into your flawed assessment. That? that was baked into your flawed assessment. And so yeah, I saw that the Obama administration the, the that tried to, to destroy our military by starving it of resources. And it seems the Biden administration is trying to destroy our military by force feeding it wokeism. I yield back. Congressman Matt Gates, Republican from Florida, questioning Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin at today's House Armed Services Committee hearing. The U.S., United Kingdom, and Australia announcing today they're going to work together via the recently created security alliance known as AUKUS to develop hypersonic missiles. This is Washington Today. For the first time since leaving office in January 2017, former President Barack Obama returning to the White House, joining President Joe Biden, his former vice president, and current Vice President Kamala Harris to promote the Affordable Health Care Act, which Barack Obama signed into law. A dozen years ago, Barack Obama opening his remarks with a few jokes. Vice President Biden, <laughs> Vice President. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> that was all set up. <laughs> My president, Joe Biden. Vice President Harris. Our dear friend, uh, Madam Speaker, Nancy Pelosi. Uh, All the members of Congress who are in attendance today, the members of Cabinet. uh, It is good to be back in the White House. Um, It's been a while. I confess, uh, I heard some changes have been made by the current president since I was last year. Um, Apparently, Secret Service agents have to wear aviator glasses now. (laughs) The Navy mess uh, has been replaced by a Baskin Robbins. (laughs) And there's there's a cat running around, (laughs) which I I guarantee you, Bo and Sonny would have been very unhappy about. Former President Barack Obama at the White House. He went on to describe what it took to pass the Affordable Care Act in 2010. Also commended President Biden for continuing to take steps to expand health insurance coverage under it. I'm a private citizen now. But I still take it more than a passing interest in the course of our democracy. (laughs) But I'm outside the arena, and, and I know how discouraged people can get with Washington. Democrats, Republicans, independents. Everybody feels frustrated sometimes about what takes place in this town. Progress feels way too slow sometimes. Victories are often incomplete. And in a country as big and as diverse as ours, consensus never comes easily. But what the Affordable Care Act shows is that if you are driven by the core idea that together we can improve the lives of this generation and the next. And if you're persistent, if you stay with it and are willing to work through the obstacles and the criticism and continually improve where you fall short, you can make America better. You can have an impact on millions of lives. You can help make sure folks don't have to lose their homes when they get sick, that they don't have to worry whether a loved one is going to get the treatment they need. President Joe Biden understands that. He has dedicated his life to the proposition that there's something worthy about public service and that the reason to run for office is for days like today. So I could not be more honored 
to be here with him as he writes the next chapter in our story of progress. I'm grateful for all the people who've been involved in continuing to make the ASA everything it can be. And it is now my great privilege to introduce the 46th President of the United States, Joe Biden. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Please. My name is Joe Biden. I'm Barack Obama's <laughs> Vice President. And I'm Jill Biden's husband. By the way, the only reason Jill's not here today, she's working. <laughs> she's teaching. <laughs> and so I just want you to know that's why she's not here. Good afternoon, everyone. Mr. President, welcome back to the White House, man. Feels like the good old days. Being here with you brings back so many good memories. We just had lunch together, and we weren't sure who was supposed to sit where. Uh, <laughs> look, it's fitting that the first time you return to the White House is to celebrate a law, a law that's transforming millions of lives because of you. And I say because of you. We had a lot of help, the staff, and I helped a little bit. But it's because of you. A law that shows hope leads to change. And you did that. You did it. Let's be honest. The Affordable Care Act has been called a lot of things, but Obamacare is the most fitting. <laughs> Obamacare. President Joe Biden, and before that, former President Barack Obama at the White House. President Biden also signing an, an executive order that he says will fix what they're calling a family glitch in the ACA that prevented individuals who received coverage through a family member from receiving financial assistance to pay for their premium subsidies. He says it's going to help 200,000 people. Vice President Harris also there calling on Congress to make the higher income-based tax subsidies in the ACA permanent. The expanded subsidy is set to expire at the end of the 2022 coverage year. Also this from ABC News. They write, the visit from the popular former president comes as Biden struggles in the polls over his handling of 40-year high inflation and soaring gas prices. He's pinned to the ongoing war in Ukraine. Washington Today continues in a moment. There's been much more recognition of the historic contributions of America's First Ladies in recent years. So join us as C-SPAN takes you through the White House experiences of eight modern First Ladies, from Lady Bird Johnson to Melania Trump. Using material from C-SPAN's award-winning biography series, First Ladies, and source material from the C-SPAN video library, you'll hear these first spouses talk about the issues important to them while in the White House. First Ladies, in their own words, find it wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the free C-SPAN Now mobile video app and wherever you get your podcasts. Senate continuing debate today on Supreme Court nominee Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson. The goal of the Democratic leadership is a confirmation vote, a final vote by the end of the week. Senator Dick Durbin is chair of the Judiciary Committee, Democrat from Illinois. Today he thanked the three Republican senators who joined all Democrats in voting yes on a procedural vote Monday night to advance the nomination, motion passing 53 to 47. I was disappointed that on the committee... We didn't have any Republican votes. I was hoping that it would come bipartisan out of the committee. But I was heartened last night on the floor when every Democrat and three Republicans supported discharging her nomination to the floor for consideration today. I want to give a special shout out to Mitt Romney, to Lisa Murkowski, and Susan Collins. 
This is, has not been an easy assignment to step up and vote for President Biden's nominee. I respect them very much for doing so. I want to thank them as well as others who might join them. She deserves bipartisan support. Once on the court, when she starts writing her record, many who are opposing her now will realize their mistake. But for the time being, we've got an opportunity to make history with an extraordinary nominee, and I'm glad that we're going to do it this week. That's Senator Dick Durbin, the Judiciary Committee chair with reporters. The Senate soon to take up a $10 billion COVID-19 funding package that was negotiated by Democrats and Republicans in the Senate. The compromise dropping $5 billion in international aid because there was not agreement on where to cut spending elsewhere to offset it. A test vote on that, though, has failed. Senators voting to block the start of the debate, 52 to 47 against, with all Republicans and Senator the Senate Finance Committee Chair Ron Wyden, Democrat from Oregon, joining those Republicans. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, for procedural reasons, changing his vote from yes to no so he can call for another vote. Earlier in the day, Senator Schumer on the Senate floor talking about this deal, saying he supports it, but he wished that extra money was also included. The deal we announced yesterday has the support of Speaker Pelosi and President Biden, who urged Congress to work quickly to get a bill to his desk. We're going to work hard to get that done, and I hope my, my Republican colleagues will join us to move forward on this legislation. There's no reason why we shouldn't be able to get this funding passed. The administration needs it right now. And we all know that our country is in great need of replenishing our COVID health response funding, putting in the work today to keep our nation prepared against new variants will make it less likely that we get caught off guard by a new variant down the line. So this is really essential to America's well-being. It's essential to getting back to normal. All those who decried we didn't get to normal quickly enough should be supportive of this legislation, because the longer we wait, the more difficult it will be when the next variant hits. This, is, this $10 billion pack COVID package will give the federal government and our citizens the tools we need, we depend on, to continue our economic recovery, to keep our schools open, keep American families safe. The package we agreed to will provide billions more for vaccines, more testing capability, capacity, and essential $5 billion, $5 billion for more life-saving therapeutics, arguably the greatest need right now for the country. These therapeutics are great drugs, but if we don't have them ready at the ready when the new variant hits, it will let the variant get its tentacles deeper into our society. But this money will go a long way to keeping our schools, our businesses, our churches, our communities running as normally as possible should a future variant rear its nasty head. Approving this package is simply the sensible, responsible, and necessary thing to do. Republicans and Democrats alike should now work together to make sure we can move this package through the chamber. Now, while this funding is absolutely necessary, it's far from perfect. I am deeply disappointed that some of our Republican friends could not agree to include $5 billion for global response efforts. I pushed them hard to include this international funding, as of course did Senator Coons and Senators Graham and Romney, because fighting COVID abroad is intrinsically connected to keeping Americans healthy at home. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York, on the Senate floor. The Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican from Kentucky, telling reporters that when this bill comes to the Senate floor, his party will need some amendments to be allowed to be offered. And one of them is Title 42. That's the law first imposed by former President Donald Trump, allowing immigrants crossing the U.S.-Mexico border to be turned away for COVID-19 public health reasons. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention announcing it's going to lift the Title 42 restrictions on May 23rd. Yeah, Jeff. Can you flesh out what you said a little bit about the need for amendments here uh, on the COVID bill, maybe alluding to what Senator Blunt was talking about? Is, is there going to be an amendment on Title 42 in order to get this COVID uh, bill across the finish line? Yeah, I, I think there'll have to be an amendment on Title 42 in order to move the bill. Uh, there are several other amendments that we're going to want to offer, and so we'll need to enter into some kind of uh, agreement to, to, to process these amendments in order to go forward with the bill. 
Senator Mitch McConnell at a news conference on Capitol Hill. The White House COVID-19 response coordinator Jeff Zions asked today for the Biden administration's reaction to Senator McConnell's requirement. Thank you, as always, for doing the briefing. Uh, I want to ask about COVID funding. Um, Republicans are trying to insert an amendment into the COVID deal to reinstate Title 42. There are even some Democrats, such as Arizona Senator Mark Kelly, who've said that they're open to considering such an amendment. Is the administration concerned that the decision to lift Title 42 could now threaten COVID funding? Thanks for the question. Title 42 is a public health authority, and therefore it's always been a decision made by uh, the scientists and public health experts at the CDC and it's based on the public health conditions, and it should remain independent of the urgently needed funding that we talked about today to sustain our COVID response here domestically and our global response. So this should not be included on any funding bill. Uh, The decision should be made by CDC, uh, which it has been, and that's where it belongs. Jeff Zines is White House COVID-19 response coordinator, part of today's virtual White House COVID briefing. Back to the overall COVID aid package, the $10 billion, Reuters writes, U.S. House Representatives Democrats had a mixed response to the $10 billion Senate-negotiated COVID relief deal, with some offering grudging support for a bill with less than half of what the White House sought and others wanting to hold out for more. Prominent progressive representative Rashida Tlaib said she was not sure if it made sense to pass a bill she considered too small and offered comments suggesting the Democrats could have trouble passing the measure in the House that they control by a narrow 221 to 209 margin. And House Rules Committee Chairman Jim McGovern telling Reuters, I'll support it, but I think it kind of sucks. He went on to say they left out a big chunk of what needs to be done, and that is the international assistance. Well, the House Democratic Caucus Chair, Akeem Jeffries from New York State, News conference today on Capitol Hill asked about the prospects for this bill. Are you getting any kind of sense on if the House will actually vote on the COVID preparedness bill this week? And what is your message to the Democrats who rebelled against including that in the omnibus and now you guys are voting on something that's $5 billion less and doesn't have the global vaccines in there? Well, Lita Hoyer will speak to the timing at the caucus meeting earlier today. Uh, he did not mention a precise a date or time that we'll be voting on it, but uh, some of that may depend on you know when the Senate acts. And in terms of uh, whatever is sent to us, and to the extent it does not include uh, assistance for um, COVID relief in other parts of the world, that will be a work in progress that will need to continue. I think um, we have a general understanding within the House Democratic Caucus that this pandemic is not over for any of us until it's over for all of us. And that as the wealthiest country in the history of the world, the leader of the free world, we have a responsibility um, to decisively crush this virus wherever it may be found, and certainly to help underdeveloped countries uh, do that. It's the right thing to do, but it's in the best interest of the American people. and. I know our work in that regard will continue. Congressman Akeem Jeffries is the Democratic caucus chair in the House, a news conference today on Capitol Hill. On the House floor, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, Republican from Georgia, saying that spending more is not the right approach when it comes to COVID-19. We have something coming up that Congress is going to be voting on, a 41-page COVID-19 supplemental bill. Because, for some reason, we're supposed to be spending more money that we don't have on future COVID and future COVID variants and future COVID vaccines, because really that makes a lot of sense. Why is that an emergency? It's in the future. This bill at $10 billion, of which up to $9 billion, is for Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. What is the purpose of that? It's in the future. Is this gain-of-function research? We have a lot of questions, but we don't have answers. 
This is also supposed to, for future COVID, by the way, is supposed to provide $750 million in efforts to fight future variants to build future vaccine manufacturing capacity. Haven't our vaccine manufacturers made enough money when, when COVID vaccines were mandated across the country? And they're still making a lot of money. You see, we've already spent $4.6 trillion in resources to COVID. 4.16 trillion in obligations, 3.63 trillion in outlays across 44 government agencies. The US has made 825 billion in direct payments. The US has issued 845 billion in loans. The US has given 540 billion in grants, 50 billion in contracts, mostly through HHS and defense, and so forth and on, and more spending and more spending. Again, we're over $30 trillion in debt. Currently, the death rate for COVID is 1.22%. By the way, this death rate has continued to go down. Thankfully, we're all thankful for that. But yet Congress wants to spend more money for future COVID, for future vaccines, for future variants, when there's no need to do so. What we should be doing is we should be helping Americans get back to work. We should be helping small businesses. Most of all, we should be securing our southern border to protect our country and our national security interest and to protect our people instead of being completely concerned and wrapped up in another country's border and their people. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, Republican from Georgia, on the House floor. The U.S. has been under a declaration of a COVID-19 public health emergency since January 2020, early days of the pandemic. It's been renewed every three months, and it's allowed the those initial stay-at-home orders and mask mandates. It's also allowed the FDA's ability to fast-track approval of vaccines, tests, and treatments, and Americans' ability to get those for free. The last extension of the public health emergency expires on April 15th. Senator Mike Crapo, Republican from Idaho, ranking member on the Finance Committee, asking Health and Human Services Secretary Javier Becerra today about plans going forward. Last question I have is on transitioning beyond the public health emergency. As communities across the country continue to return to normalcy, our federal policies should reflect that same shift. We've learned a lot of lessons, which telehealth, for example, is one, on things that we should extend. But we need to give clarity on where we are headed as we try to deal with post-pandemic healthcare issues. That means putting an end to needless and invasive mandates, but it also means moving our healthcare system onto a more sustainable and predictable path. Uh, we just can't operate in a permanent state of emergency and we need to move forward. With that in mind, our states, frontline providers, and working families deserve concrete timelines and plans for exiting the ongoing public health emergency because we need a smooth transition. Given the omission of any direction along these lines in the budget request, do you expect the public health emergency to end this summer? And could you please speak to the administration's progress on post-emergency transition planning across programs? Uh, you, you pointed out something <clears throat> that's critical for the American public and our, all of our industries, and that is the preparation it will take once we leave the state of public health emergency. Uh, we have committed to making sure that we give all providers at least 60 day notice of when we will uh, bring down that public health emergency declaration. We are continuing to work to make the plans for what comes next. As I mentioned to you, the president has submitted a proposal uh, and it's in the budget that would call for what comes next. So we go beyond COVID-19 to look at what might come next, the planning for that. We look forward to working with you um, on a bipartisan basis to make that happen. And what I can tell you is that everyone is seeing good signs of where we are today in COVID, uh, in terms of Omicron, in terms of the number of vaccinations, in terms of the therapeutics that we have, good signs. We hope that Congress will continue to work to provide us the funding that lets us have that happen all the way through this crisis. But what I can tell you is that as we move forward on COVID-19, regardless of what happens in the future with other pandemics or what we have to prepare for, but on COVID-19, we will telegraph to you and the rest of the public what needs to happen and as quickly as we can, as we've telegraphed that we need to continue uh, resources to provide those therapies, those medicines, those vaccines that, that are needed by the American public. Thank you. Understood. And I look forward to working with you, and I urge uh, expeditious attention to this issue. 
Senator Mike Grapo, ranking Republican on the Finance Committee. Today's hearing with Health and Human Services Secretary Javier Becerra, talking a lot about President Biden's health budget proposal for fiscal year 2023. Find the full hearing at cspan.org. Wall Street today, the Dow down 280, NASDAQ down 328, S&P down 57. Longtime Congressman Fred Upton, Republican from Michigan, announcing he is not going to run for re-election. First elected in 1987, he is currently sixth on the U.S. House seniority list. He spoke on the House floor. Even the best stories has a last chapter. This is it for me. I've done the zillions of airline miles back and forth. I've signed Fred to over a million letters, cast more votes than anyone in this chamber while here, and by most accounts have succeeded in making a difference, accomplishing what I've set out to do with more unfinished work still yet to come. Arthur Brooks recently wrote about three traits most important in life, honesty, compassion, and faith. I'd like to think those same yardsticks were passed along to me by my parents watching on C-SPAN now. Someone asked my wife, Amy, what would be the next chapter? She said, and they lived happily ever after. Indeed, we will. We thank Amy, our two kids, three grandkids, for giving me so much to look forward to. Thanks again to the people of my district who place their faith and confidence in me all these great years. God bless the USA. With that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back. After Republican Congressman Fred Upton spoke about his retirement, Democratic Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, also from Michigan, got up to speak. And Congresswoman Dingell mentioning the friendship between Fred Upton and her late husband, former Congressman John Dingell. Well, we may not have found harmony on every issue. Fred and I always managed to disagree without vitriolic rhetoric and mean-spirited language. Even through our toughest discussions, Fred always found a way to make me laugh, except today. It is his civility that I and Congress will miss the most. Fred really believed that he was an American first, that reaching across the aisle was important, that working together is how we get things done for the American people. His retiring is a loss for this country and especially the people of Michigan. Fred is a dear friend to me, was John's best friend, was there when John died. The Dingle family loves him. He is one of the greatest Michiganders to serve our country. I wish him Amy and their family the best as they appear, prepare for the next adventure. And there will be one. Thank you, Fred. Congressman Debbie Dingell, Democrat from Michigan, on the House floor. Fred Upton, by the way, is the fourth House Republican out of the 10 who voted to impeach former President Donald Trump after the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol to say he's not going to run for re-election. The others are Anthony Gonzalez of Ohio, John Katko from New York, and Adam Kinzinger from Illinois. Also due to redistricting in Michigan, had he run, Fred Upton would have had to run in a Republican primary against another sitting House member, Bill Huzenga. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's evening newsletter word for word to get more top Washington stories sent to you each day. You can go to c-span.org forward slash connect to sign up. Hope you have a good night.